As we continue our study in the Gospel of John, we're in John chapter 9. And it's very obvious that the events of chapter 9 are connected to the events, or continuation of chapter 8. Jesus is still in Jerusalem, he's, where he attended the Feast of the Tabernacles, and he's still affirming that he's the light of the world. And so in this particular case, he's healing a man born blind. John chapter 9, verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, as long as it is day, night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, the disciples were coming to Jesus, and verse 59 of chapter 8 says that he was leaving the temple, but there he's still in Jerusalem. So as he's walking the streets, Jesus notices a man that's born blind. And the disciples ask him, uh, and obviously the disciples saw him too, now, a man is blind from birth. We don't know what age he is, but obviously we know he's an adult. We're going to know that from a little bit later in the chapter. How would you describe a man born blind in the first century? Oh, disabled, bad. Disabled? Yeah. Probably helpless? Yep. He, yep. Only thing he can do is be a beggar. That's right. But the, the, the disciples and Jesus see him. And they ask a question in verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? What, what observations do you make about that statement, by that question? Well, that's a judgmental statement. All right, what do you mean by being judgmental? Well, I mean, so he's assuming that the man is blind because his parents sinned. And that's the cause of it. Or he sinned himself. That's the question he asked. Right. Who sinned? Mm -hmm. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Right. Yes, Pastor, sir. Isn't there uh, some Old Testament teaching about uh, sins uh, being passed down generation to generation to generation? Isn't there something in the Old Testament about that? Yeah, but it's not talking about, in, in, my, in my opinion, it's not talking about what I call ordinary sins. He's talking about the result of the sin of rejecting God, more or less. But there was, it, was, it was a common thought in that day that there would be sins passed down from the parents. Yeah. So you're very much right. But the, two things strike me. One is, because I think a little strange sometimes, I know y'all never noticed that. <laughs> what could this man have done before he was born to see sin that he be born blind? True. What did he do, kick his mama a little bit too hard, you know, about the fourth or fifth month? Or what? You know, what, what? Yeah. But that's the question they ask, who sinned, him? He was born this way. But the other thing that strikes me, the more important thing is, what do you think the frame of mind is of the disciples when they ask this question? I think, I think it's more out of curiosity than it is compassion. I mean, maybe I'm making a big deal out of it. I don't know. It almost sounds like they're a Pharisee. You know, that's, the Pharisees are always trying to yeah. price in something. So when Jamie said it's judgmental, that's exactly right. They're taking that, that Pharisaical look, uh, attitude toward it. But they're asking out of curiosity instead of compassion. Was this blindness a result of his own sin or his parents? But how did Jesus answer? It was neither one. Neither one. Neither one. Well, then why was he born blind? So the works of God could be shown to glorify. And who's to do those works of God? Jesus. Uh, is it just Jesus? No. Verse 4 says, we. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus is talking, Yes. It's in the power of Jesus, but he's saying we must do the works. Now, 
I found this interesting in some of the commentaries that I was reading. The way it is written, with, pay attention to the punctuation. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now that's the way the English writers have punctuated it. But read it this way. It was neither this man sin, nor his parents, period. But so the works of God might be displayed in him, comma, we must do the works of him who sent me. Two different, it's the same words, but the punctuation is a little bit different, different emphasis. But the truth of the matter is, no matter which way you look at it, it is the works of God that's, that's going to be glorified. Everything that we do is to, is to exalt the God the Father, exalt J Jesus the, the Christ. So this man was born blind. They, they, the disciples looked upon the blind man, but they looked beyond the man. So out of curiosity, they asked, what did this guy do to be born blind? And God told, uh, Jesus told him so that God, the power of God can be worked in. And so then he began to do a demonstration in spite of the disciples' inconsideration. He did a demonstration of the works that were to be done. When, when, verse 6, when Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and applied the clay to his eyes, and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Jesus here demonstrates his awesome power. He spits on the ground. He makes mud from the spittle and the dirt. And he puts it on the man's eyes. And then he tells him, now go down to the pool and wash. The man did. And he came back and he was able to see. Again, his, keep in mind, he had been born blind. And now you can see. So we know who healed him. But the question I'm going to ask you is, what healed him? Was it the mud? That was what... Was there something special about the mud? Was it something special about the pool of Siloam? You remember when the uh, he, when Jesus healed the uh, the paralyzed man, and it was by the pool of Bethesda. You know, they said when the angel stirred the water, the first one that got into the water would be the one that would be healed. He said, "Before I can get when the water gets stirred, before I can get there, everybody else everybody, everybody else beats me to it." So the belief was there was something magical about the water in the pool of Bethesda. Is there something magical about the pool of Bethesda? I mean, uh, the pool of Siloam? So what healed him? The mud? The pool? Faith. His faith. His faith. His faith. The mud and the pool had nothing to do with it. Jesus could have just spoke his sight into his eyes. But he put the mud on his eyes. He told him to go wash in the pool. And the man did it. He said, so he went away, he washed, and he came back seeing. If there was any discussion about the, between the man and God, uh, between the man and Jesus, from the time Jesus gave him that instructions, it was not recorded. But because the man did what he was told to do, he went he might have thought, he might have been thinking, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard of in my life. He might have been thinking, I've been blind so long, I'll try anything. Or he may have been thinking, there's something different about this man. I'm going to listen to what he says. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. All it does tell us is that he went, as soon as Jesus instructed him, go down to the pool, wash. He did it. And he came back able to see. It was his obedient faith that healed him. It was not the mud. It was not the pool. It was obeying Jesus. Now, the pool of Siloam means sent. Jesus is referred to all the, all the time throughout, or not all the time, but several times throughout the Gospel of John as the one who was sent. 
but the man is able to return, able to see. He's physically been healed. That leads to the speculation. The neighbors have an, begin to interrogate the blind man. Look at verse 8. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, but, it, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the one. And so they were saying to him, How then were your eyes opened? He answered, he said, The man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and I washed and I received sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. So here they were completely confused. And they questioned the neighbors. They, they saw the miracle. They had seen the man. They knew he'd been born blind. They knew he was a beggar. They knew all about him from a physical standpoint. They said, isn't he the beggar? Isn't he the one that used to be blind? Some said yes. Some, I mean, some were questioning that. Others were saying, no, that's not him. That's just somebody who looks like him. But he kept asking the whole time, yeah, it's me. Hey, look, it's me. And so in their confusion, they questioned not only whether he's the same man, but they also questioned, how, then, how is this possible? How, how did your eyes get open? How did you get your sight? And he told them verbatim, the man who is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, said, go wash. I went away and washed, and I received sight. He affirms that he is the same man. He affirms that Jesus is the one that did the healing. He testifies. Anytime Jesus heals us, there should be an immediate testimony, and that's exactly what this man did. So that's the first step of the interrogation. Second step of the interrogation is when the Pharisees take over. In verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees a man who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division amongst them. And so they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he answered, He is a prophet. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until, until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and they questioned them saying, Is this your son whom you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he, how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So the, the wicked religious leader now investigate both the individual, the man, and his parents. Now notice something different. This is not the first time that the Pharisees have gotten upset because Jesus did healed, especially healing on the Sabbath. But what's different now? Instead of them interrogating Jesus like they have been doing, now they're interrogating the man that was healed. And they asked him to confirm that it was on the Sabbath. And he, it was on the Sabbath. And of course, on, by being on the Sabbath, that, that was created a major problem for the Pharisees because no work was supposed to be done on the Sabbath. Pharisees asked the man what happened in verse 15. And the man told them exactly what Jesus did. And the Pharisee says, some of them said, this man Jesus is not for God because he's working on the Sabbath. But the others were saying in verse 16, how can an ordinary man do something like this if he's a sinner? Now why were some of them saying he was a sinner? The law 
And what about the law? Don't work on the Sabbath. Law says you can't do anything on Sabbath. Yeah. Yet Jesus did. But let me ask you this question. If God listens to Jesus, when Jesus asked God to give, him, give this man sight, then did he violate the Sabbath? No. No. He didn't violate the Sabbath at all. So the Pharisees, when they're, when they're saying this man is a sinner and can, trying to condemn him, trying to put him out, then the others were asking, well, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? What are, they, what are they really saying? If he's a sinner, how does he have the power of God in him? If he's a sinner, how can he do such things? Now, is God consistent with his law? Yeah. So these Pharisees are saying, on the one hand, He's a sinner because he broke the Sabbath, but God gave him power to heal. How can he be a sinner? So what they tried to go about proving was that this miracle was a whole, was a fraud. And so they say to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And in verse 17, he said, he is a prophet. He must be a prophet. Well, that wasn't good enough for them, so they went to the Pharisees. I mean, the Pharisees went to the parents. In verse 18, it says, Jews did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight. Where did the Pharisees hang out? Temple. Well, where? What, what town? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Where did this blind beggar beg? Under the temple. Jerusalem. <clears throat> Now, do you think Jerusalem was small enough in the first century that they, the Pharisees have seen this beggar, yeah. this blind beggar? Sure. And now they're turning around saying, we don't believe you've ever been blind. We don't believe you uh, have now received sight. What are they thinking? They faked it? The spin is nothing new. The spin is nothing new. Fake news is way back <laughs> in 2,000 years ago. Misinformation. But again, they're trying to... They're trying to um, <laughs> <laughs> completely say that the miracle was a flaw or was a fraud. And all he had said was, I was blind. He applied clay to my eyes. He told me to go wash. I washed. Now I can see. He said, it can't be. So he went and got the parents. Is this your son? The parents said, yes, it is. It was he born blind? Yes, he was. Well, then tell me now, how can he see? That's impossible. And they said what? Ask him. Yeah, you better ask him, buddy. We don't know. We don't know how it's possible. We don't know who did it. Is that because they weren't informed? No. No, no it's because they were scared to death of the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees already said anybody who confessed Christ would be put out of the temple. And so they said yes to the first two questions. But they, didn't, they declined to answer the third one because, like I said, they didn't want to be put out of the temple. They just didn't want to lose. They wanted their way to be right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They were looking, they were questioning both the uh, Pharisee, I mean, the, 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 the healed man and the parents, hoping to find something that they could condemn Jesus about. They were looking for anything. Because you're right, they didn't want to lose. They didn't want to lose their power. They didn't want to lose their prestige. Even though they, but more than anybody else, should have known the Messiah was the one that was in their midst. But look at what he said. Well, we ain't gotten that far yet. Start to jump ahead. But he said he's, he is of age. Ask him. That's why I said a while ago, we know he's an adult. So what do they do? They go back to the blind man again. And now at this time, they're castigating him. They're looking for a way to condemn Jesus' sin. Sin in their eyes. So verse 24. So a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Now when he said give glory to God, they don't say, you're not saying it like you and I say it. 
They're, they're, they're mocking him, but they're also saying, that's a way of them saying, you make sure you tell the truth, you're testifying before God. Mm -hmm. This man is a sinner. Mm. We, and look at that, look, they're not just accusing him, they're saying, we know that this man is a sinner. But how did the man answer? Verse 25. He said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? Now he's mocking them. They reviled him and he said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but for this man, we do not know where he's from. The man answered and said to them, well, here's an amazing thing that you do not know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears them. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would do nothing. And they answered him, you were, you were born entirely in sins and you were teaching us. So they put him out. So first he's denounced by the sinners. Look at verse 24. I uh, mentioned it a while ago. We know that this man is a sinner. In verse 26, he says, what did, he, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? In verse 28, they reviled him and said, you were his disciples. You see the castigation that they're giving to him? They're putting him down. They're saying, we know that he is a sinner. They're saying it as a statement of knowledge. Now he said it in verse 16 too. They said, this, how can, this man is a sinner. He does not, he's not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. He says it again in verse 24. But in verse 29, he said, we don't know anything about him. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but for this man, we, don't, we do not know where he's from. It's amazing how much they do know he's a sinner. He's not from God. He can't do this. Oh, but we don't know where he's from. But what did the man say? He's the one that defended Jesus. In verse 25, he said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. In verse 27, he said, no, not 27. I lost where it is. But anyway, what he kept saying was, I don't look, I don't know anything about him. I don't know if he's a sinner. I don't know if he's a prophet. But all I do know is I was blind and now, and now I can see. see. So he must be a prophet. He said in verse 30 through 33, nobody's ever been able to do anything like this. If this man were not from God, he couldn't do it. Now the disciples, I mean the Pharisees were saying, you either got to belong to Moses in verse 28, or you got to belong to Jesus. You can't do both. You are either disciples of Jesus Christ or you're the, or disciples of Moses. Why is it you can't do both? Did not through Moses the law come? Did not through Abraham, through Moses, and through all the other Old Testament prophets, were not the law, the, uh, the, the lineage and the prophecies given that said the Messiah is coming? But when he says you're his disciple, basically you're not, we are disciples of Moses, the basically what he's saying is we're a good Jew. You're not. Isn't it amazing that they did not know the lineage well enough to just kind of put two and two together here? The Pharisees, for goodness sakes, they knew the line of David. They knew it, and they knew the Old Testament prophecies, too. Right? It's just amazing. They saw it being fulfilled. But I think, this is not biblical, this is my opinion. I think they didn't want to see it. Well, that's what it is. 
They wanted uh, their own way. They wanted their own way. Yeah. It's a power thing. It's, it's power, it's control. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Nothing sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, in a, in, a, in a moment of confession, I tried to do God's business my way one time before, too. It didn't work, did it? It didn't work at all. But it's a funny story. It didn't, it didn't come close to working. <laughs> That, that's why I say with great confidence, my way has never worked for anybody but Frank Sinatra. Because <laughs> he made a million dollars off of my way. <clears throat> that's cute. <laughs> but look at, look at the way he answered in verse 30. Well, here's a, the man that was healed said, here's an amazing thing. You don't know where he's from. Yet he opened my eyes and then he goes on with it, gives him a theology lesson. We know that God doesn't hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears them. So what is this man saying? This man saying he has to be from God because the only way in which he can heal my blindness and to, and to give me sight is it had to have the power of God in it. If he was a sinner, God would have answered him. And he goes on in verse 32. He said, since the beginning of time, it's never been possible that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. And again, a great statement of faith. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He could do nothing. Now, isn't that just like John's teaching? I mean, Jesus is teaching. We're going to read later in a later chapter. Mm -hmm. I am the branch. I am the vine. You are the branch. He who abides in me, I'll abide in him. Apart from me, you can, you can do nothing. This man who was born blind, who was a beggar, who from a theological education standpoint knew nothing, is now schooling these Pharisees who are supposed to be the scholars of the day and said, he has to be from God. God wouldn't listen to a sinner, and only God can give you the power to open the eyes of a man born blind. And listen to the way they scorn and put him down. You were born entirely in sin, and yet you're teaching us. And so they put him out of the temple. They cast him out. They excommunicated him. Well, just like the, the cripple that was healed, Jesus came looking for him. Verse 35. Jesus heard they had put him out and finding him, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Mm. Mm. Jesus came and revealed himself to that man. He Isn't said, that, Excuse me, Pastor. Go ahead. Uh, isn't that interesting uh, in verse 39? And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Since you brought it up, I was going to ask that question in a minute. Let's okay, ask it now. Sorry, sorry. I just, that's okay. No, that's okay. Jesus himself is saying he came into this world for two reasons. What are they? Seek and save. 
Well, no, I'm talking about right here in this verse. Well, but he did come well, to seek and to save. You're it's absolutely part right. Of this verse, though, I think. It's part of it, but I mean, yeah. using the terminology that's in these verses. Yeah. He came so that the blind might see. Yeah. Now, is he talking about physical spiritual. sight? Spiritual. Here he's talking about spiritual sight. Spiritual sight. And those who think they can see will become blind. Now, the Pharisees that were there heard that, and their guilty conscience was pricked. Because look at what they asked him. We're not blind too, are we? And I kind of picture them as asking this question, not defiantly, but more like, you accusing me? And Jesus said, yep. <laughs> He's talking about spiritual sight. Spiritual sight will be given to everybody who sincerely asks. It doesn't matter how good your physical sight is. Spiritually, you're blind until you see the light of, that Jesus is. So he, Jesus witnessed to the man that he is indeed the Messiah, and the man, believing, worshiped the Savior. That's where he got his spiritual healing. But the Pharisees and those who think they can see, those who think they know, those who have rejected Jesus, they are in eternal blindness. Now, did Jesus come to make men blind? No. He didn't come to make them blind. They're already blind. He was the light so they could see. And why is it that, why is it, that, like in this case, the Pharisees, who think they can see, why is it that they are still blind? Stubborn. Because they don't truly believe. Because what? No, what? Stubborn. Stubborn? <laughs> they, they refuse to see the light. Look, if you close your eyes, you're in the dark, are you not? Mm -hmm. Well, no, let's just do it this way. If I turn out the light, we would be in the dark, right? Right. Okay. And if we're in the dark, we can't see very well. But the light's right there. What do we got to do? Flip Just flip the switch. If we don't do it, what are we going to do? What's, what state are we going to be in? Dark. We're going to stay in the darkness. It's optional. It's up to us. All we got to do is turn on the light. Mm -hmm. Well, spiritually... The light was right there with them. At this particular point, the light was physically in their presence, not just spiritually. But because their eyes were closed, because they, they were in the dark, they would not let the light penetrate. So they're spiritually blind because they remain in the darkness. So what is it that Jesus is telling all of us? If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. What sin is he talking about? The rejection. Of the sin of rejection. Sin of rejection. Unbelief. Unbelief. Yeah. That's exactly right. They knew it all. They had, we are disciples of Moses. We studied the law. We know the book. Probably had a big old copy of the Torah right under the under them. <laughs> but do you, blind beggar, born blind because of your sin, you going to try and teach us? Jesus is sitting right there talking to them, saying, I came so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. The conclusions I want to leave that I get out of this story, <coughs> besides the obvious fact that Jesus is the light of the world, is that it is worse to see and reject the light of the world <coughs> than to have never seen it in the first place.
this man who at the beginning of chapter 9 had no physical sight and he had no spiritual sight. But he had an encounter with Jesus Christ and now he has both. But these Pharisees who had all the right answers if you ask them <coughs> saw the light and had physical sight but they rejected and didn't believe the light and so they never got spiritual sight but we know that this man is a sinner and in reality look in the mirror buddy because you are the sinner so the question is since Jesus is the light of the world as he said in verse 5 which is the second time he has said this there's a third time he's going to say it in a, few, a couple more chapters. Have you allowed the light of the world to light up your world? Because that is what it's all about. Or are you going to rest in your, your knowledge, your position, your prestige, your power, whatever it may be, and reject the light of the world and remain in the dark. The choice is yours, but you got to make it. Let's close. Father God, again, we thank you so much that we have seen the light and that we know that that light is Jesus. And we have had our eyes opened we have received our sight, like the, like the beggar who was, who was physically couldn't see. Spiritually, we were blind. But now we have sight. Now we see. But Father, may we take that light of you that you have put into our soul, into our body, and let us reflect that light so that others will know about the light, the saving light of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that the blind will see that the lame will walk, the deaf will hear, because it's all about your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross, dying in our place, and being raised from the dead, so that we would be reconciled unto you for all of eternity. Father, I pray that your will will be done, and that the, those who are listening, those who are watching, who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that today they will receive that salvation by putting their faith and trust in you, just as this blind beggar did. To you we give all power, praise, and glory. For this is our prayer in your name. Amen.